Uh, so whilst issuing the customary apology about not being remotely worthy of this stage uh, has perhaps become an empty cliche, I'm afraid in this instance it's warranted. Uh, but there is a, you know, you'll be rightly wondering what, what is this little guy doing up there. Um, but there's a second issue too, I'm afraid. Uh, you know, the sheer expansive reach of Paul's work leaves us commentators, if I may call myself that, it's a bit vainglorious, but us commentators, um, convulsed with a certain kind of intellectual doubt. Namely, where do you start? But what I think I all, for all of us I can say, I, alongside many others, came to Paul, as a, as a, Paul's writing rather, as a searing and searching voice on the deep reach of a colonial raciology and its remade logics of new racism as applicable to the uh, late 20th century. But I suppose what has endured for me most personally is how Paul has consistently framed the play of race and racism within and through the logics of what we otherwise call nationalism. And across my own life, one that has spanned Sri Lanka as a Tamil, Sweden as it happened, Stockholm as an immigrant, and in Vandrare, Svartskala Tilomel for Dom Somvet, Khan. Some, some new. <laughs> and the UK, as God knows what, but, but something not quite right. Uh, I enjoy, a, I think, a slightly racially indeterminate position in, in Britain, and in some senses that's amusing, but still something not quite right. And across all these settings, it has been the suffocating template of nationalism with all its respective invocations of belonging and non-belonging that has proved the shared uns and, and, and unshakable knot. With all its talk of, of authentic cultures, historical mandates, majoritarian chauvinisms, and of course, its multiple ceaseless expressions, violent expressions of an of a anti-migrant bordering and, and demagoguery. And to put it mildly, very mildly, we seem to be living again amidst intensely nationalist times. Now, the span of nationalism, by my reckoning, has been punctu in, in Western Europe, that is, has been punctuated by two bursts of intensity. The first, the era, the romantic era, uh, the era of romantic expressionism and the major nation-making projects that it sponsored, culminating perhaps in the spring of nations of 1848, which is particularly relevant in areas like Denmark, perhaps, no, not Norway, perhaps. Second, the early 20th century era of protectionist mercantilism, as tied to fading imperial authority and broader economic uncertainties or instabilities that yielded two world wars, fascism, of course, and the not entirely unrelated crafting of the welfare state contract. Now, we seem to, me the, we seem to be in the midst of a third such intensity. Now, in light of this all-assailing reconsolidation, I wish to lift forth in this talk two themes that cut through Paul's work. First, it is his mapping of how the toxic appeal of nationalism also draws upon various leftist repertoires, which we often or mistakenly think inured from such contagion. And secondly, as a, a direct inverse of that, it is Paul's clarion call for us to stay alive to the countercurrents of everyday multicultural life and sociability that might, just might, furnish us with the resources for thinking beyond the illusory promise and clarity of nation and its attendant communitarian logics. Let me start, however, with some more basic definitional work. Of course, nationalism can be understood as many things at once. But I think it is safe to say, whatever your, your particular political orientations, that it is race-making that has most over-determined today's nationalist enmity whether extreme or mainstream, whether far-right or centrist, via its constitutive issues of immigration, the nigh world historical concerns about the specter of the Muslim, and indeed the alleged corrosiveness of ethnic diversity as a social condition in itself. 
And these are racialized me mechanisms that not, not only inferiorize those who are understood as not belonging, but also overdetermine. No, you see, the, the, the other becomes the overdetermined and outsi outsized object of political discourse, distorting in turn the character and content of putatively democratic deliberation writ large. You know, after all, to know yourself as a, you know, to be at the sharp end of a nationalist politics is to know yourself not only as an outsider, but as an outsider that is incessantly and actively spoken of. And this is a different kind of process than just exclusion in itself. Indeed, we might say that nationalism can even be characterized as those particular processes or moments by which political discourse centers the specter of non-belonging when trying to reckon with or make sense of its assorted security, cultural, I don't know, economic concerns, whether real or imagined. I happen to think mostly imagined, but that's not for me to determine. Now, now I'm aware in you know, some of your glances. I know that any such speak of the centrality of constitutive outsides, to use a particular theoretical term, will seem obscenely obvious, obscenely familiar to the well-initiated amongst you. But it is to be remembered that the off-sighted authority on the historical specificity of the nation, Benedict Anderson, was himself tellingly blasé about this, it, uh, intimating indeed that the nation itself is rather a benign entity. You know, there are various moments in his imagined communities where it seems as if the nation is simply a conduit via which to stage community. A structure of belonging, though itself unique to modernity, is itself merely an iteration of a broader move common to all history, a move that attests to the supposed comforts of fellow feeling and the realities of communal distinctiveness and even love, which is a term that he uses quite deliberately and explicitly. So it is, it is amidst this ultimately sympathetic disposition that still prevails, that it is to, remember, to be remembered that the distinctive daring of Paul's Ain't No Black in the Union Jack was not simply that it successfully grounded the centrality of nationalist racisms to everyday British political culture, but also that it spoke against so many implicit assumptions of the left too, including various taken for granted nostrums of what Paul describes as a homely cultural studies. A fantastic tradition, of course, but still at times a homely cultural studies. As he witheringly put it, quote, it is as if the only problem with nationalism is that the Tories have secured a near exclusive monopoly of it. The Tories meaning the conservatives in the British parlance. And so what, what Paul was here in bringing into view, as he restates in a recent interview, was how a texture of what we might call a English socialism often overlaps with a more maudlin English nativism typically ascribed to, to uh, conservatism. As he put it in a recent interview, using the particular political registers unique to Britain, so you'll be quite confused, but I'll read it anyways. <laughs> I wanted people to identify and enter that uncomfortable space where Benism, let's call that as a stand-in for social, English socialism, and Powellism, stand-in for a lot of unfortunate things, but a certain kind of unreconstructed English racism or conservatism. And so where Benism and Powellism could be shown to be adjacent. And this is an insight, as sketched in 1987, though the interview is, of course, far more recent, but the book is from 1987, that has proven particularly prescient. I'm sure this applies to all European contexts, and I, can, I, I would certainly like to speak about various other European contexts, but I'll speak about Britain now. We have in Britain, in the present, a formal left that either acts as apologists or in their desperate attempts not to alienate an electorate they construe as being nationalist has yielded an extraordinarily dangerous and chronic form of indecision and quietism. And you know, corners of the British left are even fond of citing Trump, Le Pen, Brexit, etc. as being the result of straightforwardly anti-capitalist impulses. <laughs> 
And this version of analysis often put forward, often put forward by self-styled spokespersons of working class authenticity, then accepts retrenchment to the nation as a, as a, as a valid anti-neoliberal move. And what's interesting is that the fact that some middle class people oppose nationalism further compounds this mistaken notion that the new nationalist cry must be anti-capitalist, or at the very least, a recognizable act of anti-elite working class assertion. Now, this is for me a typical case of bad Marxism done worse. I, I'm, glad, I'm very proud of this coinage, and often it lands blank. <laughs> I happen to think it's rather clever, if I may say so. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> well, you see. You see, it is an analysis that takes the metaphor of oppositional class interests and writes it into every corner streak and recess of culture and ideology. And, so, and whilst I cannot address here every, every rendition of how nationalism obtains a leftist inflection, I just want to isolate a few angles which I find to be particularly misleading. In Britain, a prominent left nationalist move is the classic, the working class has spoken ploy. Here, the multiple dimensions of nationalism are all reduced in a popular analysis to being a working class politics. In this way, anti-immigration is normalized as a sentiment of the working classes, denying the petty bourgeois triumph that the nation actually is, at the same time as nationalism is read as anti-capitalist politics, as opposed to the anti-minority racism that it so violently and belligerently and overtly and actively affirms. And one trope key to this assessment it's a supposed, you'll be all familiar with this, it's a supposed working class culture versus cosmopolitanism distinction. What the ubiquitous David Goodhart, I won't give you much color on that, but it's all rather unfortunate anyhow. Um, what, but he is very influential. What the ubiquitous Goodhart calls the anywheres versus the somewheres, or is it the nowheres? He has very strange neologisms, but it's a little hard to recall. I think it is the anywheres versus the somewheres. And the anywheres are rootless cosmopolitans, and the somewheres are salt of the earth, nativists. And it is often said here that the working classes lack the resources to cultivate attitudes more receptive to immigration or ethnic diversity. Similarly, cosmopolitanism on, and cognate notions of anti-racism or multiculture become seen as the preserve of the deracinated liberal metropolitan middle classes. Such values are presented therein as being hostile to any genuinely progressive class project, and denial of this fact is put down to the smug arrogance of metropolitan elites. Now, I'm afraid that some important truths require re restating here. First, this above conceit ignores the dynamics of many British cities. The unspectacular commitment to multiculture in urban working class life, some urban working class life, is well documented, and I will address it in fuller detail later on. But it suffices to say that even just minimal awareness of this reality makes it seriously hard to justify the contention that the liberal middle classes of all people enjoy the monopoly on cosmopolitanism. And although some middle class people might share in a commitment to multiculture, they are scarcely its only or even its most relevant or primary agents or symbols. Indeed, much, though not all, much though not all of what is narrated as a middle class embrace of multiculture could equally be described in many instances as a rather thin marketplace consumption of ethnic diversity. A commitment quickly forgotten when Polish off-licenses, I don't know if you know what an off-license is, it's a corner, a corner shop of sorts, yeah? a convenience store, and the Polish person being the most evocative of East, Eastern European immigration. Um, but you know, when Polish off-licenses outnumber, I don't know, bespoke coffee shops, avocado vendors, sourdough bakers, 
I don't mean to deride, I'm also equally party to all these fancies, but, but nonetheless. Yeah, exactly, aren't you? I am. Uh, um, <laughs> or when multicultural neighbors become noisy nuisances, and when these personal discomforts become weaponized through the police, through consumer spending power, and through property prices. Herein, not only is the middle class not the place to start when trying to appraise everyday cosmopolitanism, but the reality of many working class areas discredit the thesis that a resource deficit helps explain any such wariness to diver ethnic diversity or immigration. Rather, such wariness is much better explained by the defensive narratives of nationalism as rehearsed over a longer period through which people have been invited to make sense of their political lives. And that, that, that this analysis is often ignored is on account, probably on account, of the often melancholic visualizations of the working class as white and exclusively white. It is particularly important to deconstruct this myth because of this important ennobling sense of injury and victimhood that it lends nationalism. In this assessment, the working classes are invested with whiteness, and then it, this whiteness is seen as being imperiled or threatened by immigration, by anti-racism, by equalities policy, by so-called political correctness, and by the very idea of a multi-ethnic society in itself. And as ever, unfortunately, leftist social science in Britain, but elsewhere too, has become particularly good at recycling this fallacy. A fallacy in which class suffering is seen as a justification for racial nationalisms and or where white interviewee testimonies, sorry, white interviewees' testimonies about the dangers of immigration are presented and read as unmediated social truths, as unmediated social truths, as if they are transparent social facts. And needless to say, not only does all of this result in a grossly myopic take on what the best of a left project could possibly be, but there is also a recurring failure to understand that nationalism cannot be opportunistically gamed for anti-capitalist ends. Nationalism is never simply a means to something else, not least left collectivism. Nationalism in my books is always on, in its own autonomous terms, in the final instance, about its own nativisms and its own exclusionary racisms. Anything else is simply an unwitting or sometimes willful accomplice rallied along the way to make its appeal seem more likely. And it seems to me that the left self, you know, self-frustrating bartering with it is simply to misidentify with the leftist alibis that nationalism all across the 20th century have solicited to such great effect. But it is nonetheless a tragedy, of course, that, none the, uh, that, that such, to note that such errors are being yet again repeated. But to end on this solemn note would be to, uh, would be to do an injustice to Paul's always, always searching engagement of modernity's countercurrents, as in fact he previewed in his few remarks this morning. Paul's is a method that, at least as I read it, that never settles for the task of critique in itself and or mere fairly cliched valorization of fringe oppositionality. As he put it recently, this is an extensive quote, so I will read, quote, there are some people, rightly or wrongly, who want anti-racism to be a critical project only. Ellipse. I don't think that it is enough. And I don't think, I do, I'm sorry, and I think that we do that work better, we do it much better, if we already have an idea of the world we want to make. Now it is this admittedly dreamy inclination that remains to me so seductive about Paul's writing, wherein to insist upon alternative horizons as sourced in the minor keys of today, as sourced in the minor keys of today, always remains However thankless, a fundamental task for critique that is also affirmative, 
So it is in this spirit that I want to stress today, as a counterpoint to all this talk of nationalist closure, the enduring realities of what Paul has described as convivial multiculture. Now, of course, we shouldn't romanticize this multiculture wherever it might be. Of course, we shouldn't overstate its presence. And of course, we should remain cognizant of its many fragilities. But nonetheless, it remains an important resource and reference, if properly commanded, that begins to hint at the possibilities of important post-nationalist politics of solidarity. And crucially, and this is important, crucially, contrary to really rather orientalist and exotic accounts of this multiculture, this is not some silly color rush party, you know, but white working class people too remain an integral presence, often remain an integral presence in those, in those formations. And this is important in my own life. This has been a very, imp a point that I cl hold close to my heart in the estates that I grew up in, North Stockholm, not all, but many of the same white people who lived there shared in our same cultural literacies as, as forged in the crucible of diasporic, well, di diasporic literacies, diasporic anti-racisms, diasporic senses of togetherness. And importantly, such multicultural circuits takes the presence of difference alongside the flows of migration into and out of a locale as being a matter of fact, non-negotiable feature of social, of social or urban life. And the normalization of such ground rules creates in turn, for me anyways, a prefigurative base, to overuse a kind of heavy theoretical term, but a, a prefigurative base for much more far-reaching political affinities, affinities far more suspicious of the attempts to regiment space, culture, and politics along easy communitarian lines. You know, to, bu to bundle perhaps two different lines of, of Paul, it is the ludic cosmopolitan energies and the feral beauty of the post-colonial city where alternatives to the nationalist closure might best be had. I have, okay, so a few more minutes. So, I don't know, I just want to do a little academic uh, signposting here. I have no idea how interesting you find any of this, but just indulge me. There are a couple of frustrations that I have about British sociology's initial approach to this multiculture. For instance, the, the, the initial research culture tended to only locate any such multiculture in, in those much more fabled global cities, okay? And a selectiveness to which I too have been party when doing research of all places in London and Stockholm. You know, in my defense, I was a very young person, so it's completely understandable why I want to be there. But nonetheless, this was perhaps the, 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 the slightly overstudied, perhaps even slightly fetishized fixation with the inner city. And a, and a certain kind of fetishism that occasionally ran unsettlingly close to a broader consumerist free zone for all things inner city. You know, put in a slightly grandiose terms, it could be perhaps even said that urban sociology, urbanism, geography, was briefly complicit in the broader commodified aestheticization of the inner city in a, ma in a manner that began to appeal to that very self-satisfied middle class who were aggressively stylizing themselves as, I don't know what, but, you know, worldly, suave, so on, alternative, whatnot. Thankfully, however, much emergent research has successfully relocated its, its focus towards those much more semi-urban, much more provincial settings, far more mundane, and perhaps even more representative of where most of the British population is likely to be living. And this important reworking of convivial multiculture has become particularly apparent in certain kind of in, in research on fairly middling, perhaps even mediocre towns like Milton Keynes, like Epsom, my friend who's doing work there. Where else? Suburban Leicester. Ah, Daniel Birdsey's very interesting commentary on, on, on the English seaside. You know, fairly mediocre place. And when I say mediocrity, for me, medio I say that with affection. I have a I happen to think there are some utopian possibilities that sit in the mediocre. As it happens, in England we have something called luxury communism at the moment, which I actually think is, no, no, don't laugh. I think it is rather tongue-in-cheek, in all fairness. But I also think 
it is really rather misplaced. <laughs> uh, and, and it is, in fact, something around the humdrum and the mediocre that we ought to be, ought to be um, defending more aggressively. Anyhow, I digress. Uh, <laughs> But in terms of its most immediate political purchase, this burgeoning field has also relocated some of its attentions to those areas considered most politically emblematic of economic distress and putative white working class nativisms. As seen in recent studies of Peterborough, which actually features disproportionately frequently in the, a lot of this research, I don't know why, but there's an important by-election coming up in the next few weeks. Um, and Anoop Nayak's interesting multi-sided work across various deindustrializing northeast locations, uh, which to those of you who aren't familiar, it's essentially the, the, the Newcastle area. And all this work tries to bring through a carefully observed and carefully caveated notion of working-class cosmopolitanism. It is all work that remains particularly adept at balancing an appreciation of the daily breaching of ethnic and racial divides whilst always remaining attentive to the continued retrenchment of white nativism. And I think it is often forgotten that it was indeed this fraught tension that was central to Paul's after empire, his defining after empire. The book was not about a melancholic nationalism on the one hand and a convivial multiculture on the other, but it was about how both were projections simultaneously competing for validity, validity in the lives of modern Britons. Or as Connor and Parker observed when discussing a an off-derided area of already unloved Birmingham, which, which I happen to call home now, and very much love. But they, they note that it is conviviality is precisely interesting because it's always existing contiguously to the continued pathologization of racial minorities. And so the point, therefore, as I see it, is not that multicultural triumphs regardless, but that it endures and gets remade releasing energies, waiting to be harnessed by a less integrationist, less apologetic political program that might command mass purchase. And whilst this everyday multicultural sensibility has certainly found its voice independently of the Labour Party, I do note that it is also a political voice that has been proactive in lending its buoyant and youthful immediacy to Corbyn, even if Corbynism itself has proven itself somewhat or rather undeserving of such support. Now consider, for instance, the special role of something called grime for Corbyn. It's like a, a music campaign, shall we say, in injecting the Labour 2017 campaign with such an easy working class and multicultural credibility. As expertly summarized by Monique Charles, this attested to a, a a fluent, resonant, and unaffected synchronization of grime with the popular left politics. But this does go well beyond popular culture, important as that is, with the Grenfell Tower tragedy being a particularly bracing example here. You know, the politics released by that haunting moment alternated seamlessly on the one hand between, a, you know, from an uncompromisingly vocal forcefulness, and on the other, this, this, this dignified silence deafening in its pathos. And I mean here, of course, the, the monthly silent marches that some of you will be familiar with. But this is also a moment that has so creatively insisted upon its victims being understood as multi-ethnic and multi-status. You know, Grenfell was namely, I think, a really resonant microcosm of a broader working class community neglected but overexploited, that was so deeply scored by a dizzying array of not only ethnic backgrounds, but also variations in the status of their citizenship. And it is this reality that, for me, was an implicit reminder to the social democratic, socialist, whatever left it is that you speak of, let's call it a social democratic left, that it must always remain attentive, stay alive, recognize and center poverty's multi-ethnic migrant city realities. Ah, I only have 10 seconds left, so I, I, suppose, I suppose I just want to end there then. Um, I think I fear that we have become sometimes rather embarrassed about talking about the softer notions of togetherness. 
But in thinking through Paul's work, for me, it seems to me as if it is through recovering those scripts about shared life that we've become, in fact, better at confronting and meaningfully challenging not only these violent injustices, but these shamelessly false dichotomies about race and class, about immigration and the working class that this new nationalist moment circulates so frenziedly. Thank you.